Okay, all right. Hello, everybody. Hello to you all. And welcome to the 15th Co-op Ding AI event, which is the third actually fully remote one in the pandemic. And today is on gender. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Dr. Mona Sloan. I'm a sociologist here at New York University, and I work on inequality in the context of artificial intelligence design and policy. I'm a fellow at NYU's Institute for Public Knowledge, who's hosting this event. Today, I work with the Gov Lab as well as with NYU's Alliance for Public Interest Technology. I'm also an adjunct professor at the Tennant School of Engineering, and I currently have the honor of being one of the inaugural fellows with the uh, Tisch School of the Arts and their Future of Imagination Collaboratory. At IPK, I do convene the Coopting AI series, and I also curate the technology section with public books. Now, let me say first off this series, the whole series, all 15 events that we've hosted so far would not be possible with the really generous support from the Institute of Public Knowledge, as well as the co-sponsorship of the 370J project and NYU's Department of Technology, Culture and Society. Now, I am absolutely delighted to say that today's event is co-sponsored by NYU Woman 100 and that today, Dr. Lisa M. Coleman will join me as a co-host. Dr. Coleman is NYU's inaugural Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation and the university's Chief Diversity Officer. And I'm turning over to Dr. Coleman to say a few words to welcome you. Thank you so much, Mona. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. And thank you again to, of course, IPK and of course to NYU's Department of Technology, Culture and Society, and of course to the 370J Project for partnering with tonight for, the, our, uh, for, for all of this. And thank you to Ellen Toscano and Autumn Rain. You're amazing. And I know you're out there somewhere. So thanks for all your help in organizing. And to all the other people who work behind the scenes to make th this happen. Uh, you know, we've had tech crews and all of that. So just thank you to those as well. I hope everyone, all of the participants out there are taking really good care and staying well. Um, and I want to give a special shout out uh, down here in New York, you know, every night at 7 p.m. we go out and clap for all the workers all around. So to all the people out there who are our healthcare workers, our police and sanitation workers, the grocery store workers, we were talking about that earlier, uh, all of those people, thank you, because we can't, we can't, we can't be safe without all the work that you're doing. So um, as, as we segue into tonight's program, which will address questions relevant to gender and how we continue to navigate during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which is intensified, of course, for uh, inequities for particular marginalized communities. And for those reading the articles, the particular impact on women in the home and publishing and tech uh, has and continues to be uh, tremendous. That's making the work that we have to do to innovate uh, and create a stronger, more equitable future is more evident than, than ever before. So I'm really thankful to IPK for all the great work you're doing. And of course, for being a co-host tonight for tonight's panel. Uh, the, uh, the work that IPK and all of our rock star panelists are doing to demystify the mobilization of AI and of course, the uh, to think about how things are legitimized through the authority of science and technology are crucial to the all efforts directed toward reimagining gender spaces and hierarchies of power. AI and related technologies have tremendous promise as a tool for increasing access to resources, well-being, inclusion, closing the digital divides, and creating spaces of equity. But as we all know, it must be designed and leveraged with critical inquiry into the foundational logic and ideologies that inform the direction of its applications and outcomes. As, uh, as Mona mentioned, tonight's uh, discussion is part of uh, my office's, the Office of Global Inclusion's year-long initiative, and I just have to give a shout out to the committee and all the partners in that group. Um, thank you for all of your hard work. And this is focusing on the, the contributions of women in many ways. Uh, we situate this because, of course, as many of you know, it's the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment um, as a moment to reflect and contextualize on the historic and centennial with a broader intersectional and global history of the women's fight for uh, gender equality. We celebrate the achievements, the innovations, the past forged, and the possibilities being created now. And we honor those women who originally were overlooked, quite frankly, during the initial uh, 19th uh, Amendment. And that would include women of uh, non-binary, transgender uh, groups, et cetera, and some other marginalized racial and ethnic and national groups. So as you can imagine, I'm thrilled that we're having this discussion. I'm very much looking forward to a rich discussion tonight on how we think about you know, the, what I, the hijacking of tech to ask 
bigger questions on technology, sociology, inequality, ecology and justice, and of course the role of AI in constructing and reconstructing our uh, gendered reality. So Mona, thanks so much and I'm turning it back over to you. Thank you so much, Lisa. What a great opening. Uh, it's a pleasure to co-host this event uh, with you. Now, before I introduce our fantastic panelists tonight, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge that uh, by being in New York City, I'm standing on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. And I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community and the indigenous communities on whose land you're currently located and to commit to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Now, as Lisa said, at the dawn of the new decade, AI has become a code word for new power. But despite hopes that we may have for this technology to serve as the great social equalizer, there is really mounting evidence that this power, in fact, is old power in new clothes. We are seeing more and more evidence that AI is deeply entrenched within old mechanisms of exclusion and oppression. For example, we see data class classification practices in AI creating systemic violence against members of communities that are not easily classified. In other words, AI systems aren't optimized for the quote unquote edge cases that have systematically been kept away from power. Elsewhere, we have seen policy decisions suffocate possibilities for equitable participation in technology design, later blaming the pipeline problem. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at these issues and we'll be exploring questions such as, what is the link between AI and gender? How does this relate to systems of exclusion and oppression? What are alternative ways for thinking about and reclaiming power in and through AI? And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, our wonderful panelists. Starting the conversation will be Professor Mar Hicks, who is an author, historian, and prof a professor doing research on the history of computing, labor, technology, and queer science, and technology studies. Their research focuses on how gender and sexu sexuality bring hidden technological dynamics to light and how the experiences of women and LGTB QIA people change the core narratives of the history of computing in unexpected ways. Hicks' multiple award-winning book, Programmed Inequality, which I really highly recommend, looks at how the Brits lost their early lead in computing by discarding women computer workers and what this cautionary tale tells us about current issues in high tech. Following Mars' uh, remarks will be Catherine D'Ignacio and Lauren F. Klein, who just published the terrific book, Data Feminism, together. together. Uh, Catherine Ignacio is a scholar, artist slash designer, and hacker mama who focuses on feminist technology, data literacy, and civic engagement. She has run reproductive justice hackathons, designed global news recommendation systems, create, created talking and tweeting, water quality sculptures, and led walking data visualizations to envision the future of sea level rise. With Rahul Bargava, she built the platform databasic.io, a suite of tools and activities to introduce newcomers to data science. Her book from MIT Press, Data Feminism, co-authored with Lauren Klein, charts a course for more ethical, empowering data science practices. Her research at the intersection of technology, design, and social justice has been published in the Journal of Peer Production, the Journal of Community Informatics, and the Proceedings of Human Factors in Computers, Computing Systems. Her art and design projects have won awards from the TAN Foundation, Turbulence.org, and the Knight Foundation, and exhibited at the Venice Biennale and the ISA Boston. Dignacio is an assistant professor of urban science and planning at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. She is also director of the Data and Feminism Lab, which uses data and computational methods to work towards gender and racial equity, particularly in relation to space and place. Now, Together with, with Catherine, we'll hear from Lauren Klein, who is an associate professor in the departments of English and Quantitative Theory and Methods at Emory University, where she also directs the Digital Humanities Lab. She works at the intersection of data science, digital humanities, and early American literature with research focus on issues of race and gender. She has designed platforms for exploring the context of historical newspapers created forgotten visualization schemes with fabric and addressable LEDs, and with her students cooked meals for, from early American recipes and then visualized the results. 
In 2017, she was named one of the quote, rising stars in digital humanities by Inside Haria Ed. She's the author of An Archive of Taste, Race and Eating in the Early United States. And with Catherine, uh, the book Data Feminism, which just came out, as I said. With Matthew K. Gold, she edits Debates in the Digital Humanities, a hybrid print digital publication stream that explores debates in the fields as they emerge. Her current project, Data by Design, an interactive history of data visualization, 1786 to 1900, was recently funded by an NEH Mellon Fellowship for Digital Publication. Now closing the presentation part of the event will be Sarita Mruti, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Washington. Sarita unsettles tech research through decolonizing strategies, analyzes sensation and immigration, and reimagines cashless economies together with communities in the global South. Her recent book, Encoding Race, Encoding Class, Indian IT Workers in Berlin is an account of the relationship between cognitive labor and embodiment, told through the stories of programmers from India who move within migration regimes and short-term coding projects in corporate settings. Encoding Race and Coding Class was awarded the 2017 Diana Forsyth Prize and the in the Anthropology of Science, Technology and Medicine, confirmed jointly by the Committee for the Anthropology of Science, Technology and Computing and the Society for the Anthropology of Work and the 2019 International Convention of Asian Studies Book Prize for the Social Sciences. Welcome everybody. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. Before I hand over just one minute about housekeeping, we will hear from our panelists uh, in 10 to 15 minute presentations. Then Lisa will take over and respond to the uh, presentation slash provocations that we're hearing. Meanwhile, Team IPK <laughs> We'll be collecting questions on social media. So on the uh, NYU underscore IPK Twitter account and through the YouTube uh, chat function. Um, we will then start a panel discussion and a Q&A and then sort of slowly close the event. It is my pleasure and I'm really excited to say that we do have live captioning for this event um, and a recording of this event will be made available uh, after. Words. And now, Mar, welcome, and thank you so much for being here, and over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mona, for that introduction and for hosting this. Thank you to Lisa as well. Um, really excited to be here. I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen and show you a few slides, and um, if it doesn't work, maybe one of you can let me know. Let me just put my screen on share there for a sec. So hopefully you are seeing my, uh, my slides at this point. Great. Um, so I'm going to talk for a few minutes today about artificial intelligence and categorization. I'm a historian, as Mona uh, pointed out in my introduction. I'm a historian of computing and a historian of technology, but also a historian of gender and sexuality. And so when I was invited to be on this panel, I was really excited to have the chance to talk about um, not just women, um, but also to really talk about gender and gender as a category. Um, so my talk today is entitled Artificial Intelligence or Computational Imposed Identities. And the person in the back there, um, in the background of that image is a woman named Andrina Wood. And the reason I mention her name is because it's actually very hard to find the names of a lot of the women in these old photographs of which there are many of women operating and programming computers. And the reason that that ties in and the stuff that I did in my book programmed inequality ties into the discussion today, I think, is because a lot of the stuff that I do as a historian has to do with categorizing people and looking at how people have already been categorized in the past by their contemporaries, by their bosses, by the places that have collected records on them, places like you know the, the government of the country in which they lived, or the archives have collected records of them in ways that slot them into certain categories. 
And this is really important, of course, in a lot of ways, this is how people um, become visible and become visible as classes or groups of people. But it also has the effect of um, disappearing people who don't fit neatly into categories. And sometimes when, uh, for instance, a class of workers like these women computer workers exists, you know, clearly exists at the time, shifting categories and shifting ideas or ideals about, for instance, who should do such work, those kinds of categorical shifts can actually erase people from the historical record. It can make them very, very hard to find um, so that their lives are hidden, their histories are hidden, and more importantly, perhaps, the causality or the lessons that we might learn from the stories we can get from those people and those categories, that also gets lost. And so going into talking about artificial intelligence and things like algorithmic bias, I'd like to just highlight really briefly this article that I recently published on a very, very early example of transphobic algorithmic bias, perhaps one of the very first examples of transphobic algorithmic bias in the world. And this occurred in the late 50s and early 1960s in a system, a computing system that the British government was using. And very briefly, I'll just tell you that the, um, the sort of contours of this history have to do with trans um, British citizens writing to the government and trying to get the uh, gender on their national insurance cards, sort of like social security cards, corrected so that they would get the correct benefits and so that they wouldn't have to walk around with essentially a social security card that misidentified them. And prior to the British government computerizing, starting to use electronic computers, there were a variety of workarounds in order to help trans people um, correct their records. They weren't easy, they weren't necessarily sympathetic, but there were a variety of workarounds to do this. Now, the interesting thing that I found in my research is that once the government computerizes and brings in a very powerful electronic computer to instead run these national insurance um, benefits, and this is in the early 1960s, what happens is that the computer is used as an excuse to roll back or to take away the accommodations that had previously been in existence for trans people who were looking to correct their records. In other words, the government says, well, the computer can't do it, or the computer doesn't see gender, only numbers. So we'll fix the numbers on the record, but we won't fix the gender on the cards. And behind the scenes, what high level government officials are saying is that in fact, they are intentionally programming the computer to kick what they term at the time known transsexuals out of the programming process and into a more manual process that requires more oversight by the government because they want to keep an eye on these folks and they do not want to tacitly condone essentially trans people by programming them into the system as their gender. They only will program them into the system as essentially the gender that they were assigned at birth. And this is, I think, really important because it goes to show that a lot of these things that we're dealing with today and that companies are trying to set up ethics boards or, you know, failing at setting up ethics boards for dealing with today, they are very, very old problems. And it sort of takes a little bit of the steam out of some of these um, excuses that companies sometimes use to say, well, we just didn't know, this was a mistake, it's a bug in the system, we, we didn't foresee this, right? Because in fact, what's been happening is not necessarily that these are flaws or bugs, but in fact, these are the ways in which the system has been 
these are the ways in which the system has been designed to work. And we saw this very um, clearly in the situation of the Google AI ethics board and the way that Googlers had to really come out strongly against one of the transphobic um, members assigned to that board. We saw this in situations where the uh, Google walkout uh, came out against the systemic sexism and systemic racism involved in how Google um, did its, um, oops, I'm sorry, it looks like my, it looks like my slide share just got a little bit messed up. Let me just um, get back in there. Sorry about that. Um, and one of the things that uh, companies have said, and I'm just, you know, I'm not trying to just pick on Google here, but they have been pretty, um, pretty out in the press um, about what's been, you know, a really major issue, essentially fighting with their employees about the direction of the company. Um, they've said things like, Google is not a democracy. Tech is not a democracy. Um, and that these companies have essentially the right to police themselves and to do things without the sort of input that would be required if these tools were being made by governments. And so there's been a huge amount of pushback, even from within the companies themselves. And there have been a lot of folks, um, here's one of your colleagues, I think, uh, at NYU, Meredith Broussard, who um, have written about the ways in which artificial intelligence is really sold on an idea and an image and not on the reality of what it can actually do. One of the things that I think is so valuable about um, Dr. Broussard's work is the way in which she shows how systems are um, designed in the image of their creators and in the image of the time period and the applications that they're originally um, sought to be used for. And that can be incredibly, incredibly problematic. So one of the things that I wanted to offer as just a little bit of a provocation here is what about if we taking um, Broussard's lead, we start to talk about artificial intelligence as something um, in a way that's a little bit more descriptive instead of just calling it AI or artificial intelligence, which is actually a very good um, marketing term, but it's not necessarily descriptive. What if we actually said um, something a little bit more specific like artificial intelligence is computational surveillance, taxonomy and identity assignment, or it is machine oversight and behavioral modification. In most cases, it is uh, one or both of these things. But when we describe it a little bit more clearly that way, it starts to sound, in fact, very Orwellian. And it starts to, I think, raise a lot of questions just in that description. And one of the things that uh, Virginia Eubanks and many other authors, including Sophia Noble, have pointed out is that once these inequities get built into our systems, whether they're infrastructures of um, governance or technological infrastructures, we have a situation where those inequities um, do further harm and oftentimes get amplified. In fact, they usually get amplified. And we're seeing right now with the global pandemic that in the United States in particular, the coronavirus is really hurting people in ways that fall along all of the lines that American society has heretofore been racist and sexist and classist. Um, and ableist. So the coronavirus is disproportionately impacting um, women of color who are disproportionately in these frontline jobs and essential, essential work jobs where they're being forced to put themselves into um, grave danger every day. So just to put some, you know, statistics, some really grim statistics on that, um, this article from APM Research, which I just looked at, you know, today, so these are the current statistics, um, for every group of 100,000 Americans, um, 
disproportionately a higher number of Black people have died almost two to one when you look at Black people versus white people. And so to put it plainly, if all Americans had died of COVID-19 at the same rate as white Americans, at least 10,500 more Black Americans, 1,400 more Latino Americans, and 300 more Asian Americans would still be alive. And so I just would like to point out how data and taxonomy and collecting data on different groups is, of course, incredibly important. But data in the public interest and how that is used is very different from the way that most AI products and most AI advances are seeking to use that data um, right now. And of course, I mentioned this before, Sophia Noble's um, amazing book is a great place to start if you would like to learn more about all of this. Um, but to sum up, I'll just say uh, that race, gender, class, disability, and a host of other intersecting oppressions, they simply can't be taken as static categories because when they are, they become built into, they become building blocks of these artificially intelligent systems and they become therefore amplified by the systems. These systems purport to serve as neutral informational infrastructure. And in fact, oftentimes that's what they do. They're not neutral, but they do serve as our informational infrastructure, not just now, but going far into the future. And the whole point is for these infrastructures to help us govern ourselves and to help us make decisions. So it's incredibly important, I think, that we draw out this distinction between how data is used, how categories are assigned, and how it's useful sometimes to taxonomize and in other ways it can be incredibly oppressive and how there's a spectrum um, between those two polar opposites um, as well. So um, I'll stop here and I just wanna say thank you and I'm looking forward to the discussion that will ensue and hearing everybody else's comments. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Maura. And I'm gonna hand right over to Lauren and Catherine. Super. Thanks so much. Um, it's a huge honor to be on the panel with uh, Mar and Sarita's work. We really appreciate. Um, so let me just share the slides. Um, do you all see our slides? No? Yes, okay, super. Um, Great, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time on introductions because thank you Mona for introducing us already. Um, basically what we're gonna be talking about comes from our book uh, that has recently been released called uh, Data Feminism. So Lauren, I'll let you take it away. Okay, great. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for listening. I'm gonna echo what Catherine said about being so honored and excited to be on this panel with everyone else and also to apologize in advance if you hear background noise it's my daughter playing with the legos right behind me um so i thought we would start out oh you're saying hello okay hi everyone that's my daughter um so uh we thought we would start out with um a contemporary ish example you know because we hear a lot about gender bias and algorithms um, and it can sort of be this generalized concern, but there are some very specific instances where, um, where we see this happening. And one of them is in the headline you see here from 2018, when it was discovered that Amazon had been developing an algorithm to screen its first round job applicants. Um, but because the model had actually been trained on the resumes of um, current Amazon employees who are predominantly male and predominantly white, um, it, just, it developed an even stronger preference for those types of applicants. So it downgraded resumes with the word woman in it and also graduates of women's colleges. And ultimately Amazon had to cancel the project. Um, then uh, there was a different resume screening, uh, screening tool. It was some proprietary software that actually became the subject of a lawsuit. And they did a really interesting um, and depressing regression analysis. And they found that the most predictive factors of the algorithm ranking someone likely to achieve performance success was whether uh, that applicant was named Jared and if they had played lacrosse. And, you know, on the one hand, you know, it's kind of funny and absurd, these sort of random and 
specific details, but they actually do tell us a lot about the aggregate group characteristics of the people who actually are getting hired, right? Um, so Jared is a mostly men's name, a mostly white name, and lacrosse, you know, even though it has really interesting Native American origins, um, it's an expensive and predominantly elite white sport. So I'll pass it back to Catherine for our next slide. So the point here, as folks have sort of already said, um, is that um, data is the new oil, is this like a uh, sort of meme that has been circulating around that was started by The Economist magazine maybe like 10 years ago, um, which they meant in a very positive way. They meant it like data is um, the new oil, meaning something that we can extract from the kind of natural uh, kind of collection resource of data that exists out in the world, and we can extract it and we can turn it into profit, into money, into intelligence, into business advantage. Um, and so sort of billing is this kind of like new thing. Um, but for women and for other minoritized groups, data is not the new oil. And that's um, what we see, I think, in the amazing kind of pushback of work that's been happening in the past four or five years, just since we've been writing our book. Um, in fact, data is the same old oppression that has been around for centuries. It's just, it's faster, it's more opaque, it's harder to hold accountable, kind of like Mar was talking about. It's like this way of blaming it on the system, um, which one cannot change. Um, and so it's for this reason that our book, Data Feminism, advocates for bringing an intersectional feminist lens to AI and to data science more broadly. So we thought just uh, we, it would be good to do about like a 30 second uh, take to do some level setting just about what we mean by intersectional feminism. Um, so intersectionality, as many listeners probably know, um, is a term coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, um, which she uses to explain how social inequality cannot be explained by only one dimension of difference like gender. Um, so when we're talking about inequality or oppression, we need to talk about the intersection of the many factors and forces that produce it. So this includes sexism, but it also includes racism, classism, colonialism, and so on. Um, and then the, sort of the key thing to understand about intersectionality, and this is actually a thing that's often overlooked, especially in sort of mainstream, oh, my daughter tells me I'm talking about for longer than 30 seconds, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so the key takeaway here is that um, intersectionality doesn't just describe markers of individual identity and their effects, it describes these structural forces of power that we've already been talking about a lot, um, and their intersection, and then the intersection of these structural forces that create those effects. And and it really is the work of women of color feminists and black feminists in particular that have foregrounded this conversation about structural power. Um, and then one quick more note. Um, so it's worth noting also that sort of Cren uh, Crenshaw coined the term and um, you know, certainly should get all the credit for that evocative concept. But the idea was described by many others before her. So probably most famously by the Combahee River Collective, um, who in the late 1970s described systems of oppression as, quote, interlocking. Um, that was the term that they used. And then even before that, in the 19th century, there's a long line of Black women scholars and activists, so Sojourner Truth, um, Frances Harper, Anna Julia Cooper, um, and these women also described intersectionality in practice, if not by name. So bringing an intersectional lens to data science can help us challenge how forces of unequal power manifest themselves in these seemingly neutral systems. Um, so in the book, we talk a little bit about the work of Joy Bolomwini, um, who's a colleague of mine at the MIT Media Lab. So she was doing a class project as part of her work there and found that facial detection systems couldn't see her dark skin. Um, they couldn't detect that there was a face in front of them. Um, so she delved into that and she looked into the behind the scenes of what was going on there. Um, and so with Timnit Gebru, um, they delved into the data used to train and benchmark these systems and found that the data sets that they're trained on are overwhelmingly composed of lighter skinned subjects. So 80% for one important benchmarking data set and 86% light skinned people for another important uh, data set. Um, uh, and then so this, they also consequently show that darker skinned females are the most misclassified group. 
So, you know, there's sort of complementary research here. Researchers like Os Keys and Morgan Klaus Schumann have shown how gender detection technologies completely fail 100% of the time on people who are non-binary, right? Um, so Keys has this really interesting paper that shows how all technical papers about gender detection um, conceive of gender only as a binary. And then Schurman has this work that shows how facial analysis systems codify gender both into the data sets and then into the gender classifiers. And both discuss how the gender binary serves to uphold the erasure of trans and gender nonconforming people. Um, and Mar already talked about their work, but is an important part also of the conversation that is taking place um, in this area. Um, so, you know, you might look at some of this work on algorithmic bias and you might be, you know, sort of tempted to be like, okay, so what do we do about this? Um, it's about, let's, it's, it's about more diversity in STEM or maybe your conclusion is like, okay, so let's fix the training data. Let's get more representative training data sets that are representative at the level of the population. <clears throat> um, and okay, like we, um, we, we agree with this on the sort of the one hand, uh, we certainly need more diversity in STEM fields. Uh, we particularly need more diversity in computer science and machine learning. Um, and fields can do it because all the other sciences have, are doing a whole lot better on gender parity than those fields are. Um, but diversity in STEM is often framed as a woman's problem. So like the studies are done that are like, where are the missing women and why are the women leaving? Um, when in fact, it's actually a man's problem, right? So things like thinking more, framing our questions more like, why are men always leading everything? Why can't they make space for women and gender non-conforming people in these fields? Why can't they teach differently in order to inspire new generations of students to enter these fields? Um, and at the same time, you know, in the training data question, it is really important to audit algorithms. Like it's really important to quantify disparities and recognize just how much these systems are failing minoritized groups. But we also can't just fix things at the level of the data set. Um, so, you know, like, would it be better, <laughs> for example, in the case of Joy's work, um, do we want to have a system that really does a great job of recognizing women of color or non-binary folks if that system is then used to recognize and target them if they're participating in a public protest, right? That's not necessarily a, a foregone good conclusion. Um, and even Joy Bolamwini herself advocates for a really multi-pronged approach to holding facial recognition systems accountable. So she does these algorithmic audits, these more technical papers. Um, she does spoken word poetry and art projects. She does public advocacy work and she is advancing a legal moratorium on facial recognition. Um, so the point here is that it's not only about the technology being biased, like we talk about biased algorithms and things like that, but it's also about who owns the technology, how it's used, who benefits, and who, who is harmed. So we just wanted to end with a chart. This is from chapter two of our book. Um, if you wanna go look it up online. It's from a section where we're advocating for resetting some of the grounding concepts that are associated with this conversation about ethics and algorithms. So on the left, we have a list of concepts that secure power, as we say, because they locate the source of the bias in individuals or in technical systems. This is something what Mar was saying already too. Um, but then on the right, uh, we advocate for shifting towards concepts that challenge power because they're concepts that acknowledge structural power differentials, and then they work towards dismantling social inequalities. So instead of ethics, we propose justice. Instead of fixing bias, we suggest fixing oppression. Instead of designing fair systems, we propose designing equitable systems, and so on. Um, and we intended this chart really as a provocation. You know, it doesn't mean that mean that like all ethical AI work is bad, um, but only that there are higher standards that we should set if we actually want data and AI to do to do the work of repairing the harm that has already been done in the world. Um. And that's it from us. Uh, these are all of the various ways of getting in touch with us. And uh, thanks, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much both. Sarita, take it away. Thank you so much. I have the honor of, um, of bringing up the
the, the last position. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Lisa, for this great conversation. Um, so let's see. Okay. So I am an anthropologist of labor and technology. And I take this uh, as an opportunity, this question about gender as an opportunity to think about how gender and other social categories like race um, sediment a particular division of labor in tech worlds and computing worlds more largely. And at the same time, they make certain valuations about who, whose body, whose humanity is to be valued and in what way. Indeed, gender is enrolled in making valuations about who is considered fully human. In the spirit of the long colonial history of the question of labor, the human, and of gender, I'd like to offer my own um, acknowledgement of the land that I'm currently on, which is a Canarsie territory in Brooklyn, through the work of a Cree artist named Kent Monkman, whose beautiful paintings were um, were on view at the Met until very recently. Um, and I do this in the spirit of thinking about and creating a different kind of story about immigration, since that will be my topic today, um, immigrant tech workers. And uh, I wanna start with a story or try or have us think about stories that don't begin with a blank space, but begin with already populated territories and help us think through that as a different mode of engagement with the question of immigration and the question of technology. So um, I have been following how social categories like gender, race, caste, and class are woven into and normalized in tech economies writ large for some time. When we talk about computation and gender or AI and gender, and I completely agree with Mar that AI is a nebulous category. And I know Mona, you've been talking about that for quite some time as well. Um, I think that the larger political economic context is often occluded or, or obscured or, or absented. Concrete social, political, and economic relations are what give rise to ideas about intelligence, machines, and gender, even while these categories express and embody those social relations. So beginning from this perspective, to understand how gender and computation relate to each other, we must under understand how gender is a point of articulation, the term here is Stuart Hall's, for relations of class, race, ability on the one hand, and for particular hierarchies of value and labor on the other. What I would like to talk with you about today is about maintenance work. So in my research um, for the book, Encoding Race, Encoding Class, I worked alongside Indian programmers who were in Berlin on short-term visas. And they were mostly doing this kind of work, this kind of debugging work that is actually undervalued or not valued very highly in programming economies. Um, and so what I want to think through here are um, formations of masculinity. As Mars uh, book, Programming Inequality notes, um, the masculinity of programming was something that was created. Um, over time. But within this world, there are different kinds and different ways of uh, doing maleness. And some are considered more appropriate or more valued than others. So, um, you know, some work on artificial intelligence, what we can think of as artificial, ar artificial intelligence, like Lily Irani's work on the Mechanical Turk, um, looks at the people behind the screens who are actually making something look like it's happening through AI, but it's really happening through um, click work. And in an analogous way, I want to think about software as a world of work that has the similar front, front end and back end properties. There are lots of jobs that are valued, uh, highly valued as programming jobs. And then there are others like do like debugging that are necessary to maintain these systems, but are undervalued. So as I was doing my work um, in Berlin, one thing that kept coming up and kept um, being, being talked about as a trope and it showed up in newspapers and discussions everywhere was this idea of the 
East, the Eastern worker as a feminized worker. So within the already highly masculinized space of coding economies, uh, programmers from India, programmers from China increasingly were often framed as a spiritual, sensual, exotic. Um, and these two are of course drawing on very long colonial tropes um, that feminized Asian masculinity. Through that work of um, creating a certain version of masculinity that was in opposition to white heteronormative masculinity, the value that these workers brought with them, the maintenance work that they did, uh, was actually undervalued or devalued all the while their work is completely important to supporting the uh, very systems that we see on, on the front end and are advertised to us in various ways. Um, there are, of course, other ways beyond the tropes of gender um, that their work is devalued. One of them is through visa labor regimes. But what I'm pointing out here is that gender became one of the ways that an entire workforce was racialized. And it was racialized as, um, as being temporary, as doing back-end work and doing work that was more routine and required less thought than the creative work of coding. So one of the things that I argue in my book is that it's really important to think through and look at images. Images are a kind of speech act. They discipline immigrant tech workers, and they also can reform um, populations within Europe and in the United States to sort of try to get with the program, to get with the neoliberal imaginary of new work um, that is also technically sophisticated work. Of course, um, there are lots of gender tropes that move through coding economies. I just wanted to put this one up and out there because it, it ha it, you hear this all the time if you do research on coding in any way. The metaphor that coding is like cooking. Okay. Of course, this is a highly gendered, very value-laden metaphor. And what I found in my research, I, I don't have time to go into it now, is that um, lots of people who work in these fields kind of play with these metaphors. They think of themselves as master chefs, but they can also be talked about and rendered as uh, the equivalent of housewives in the kitchen. And that's regardless of um, how, they, how they present themselves as our previous speakers have talked about. So what does this have to do with AI or computing systems as a whole? Well, one really clear um, finding that I pull out of my research or a, an ethic or a politics is that maintenance really should be valued. This is a fundamental tenet of feminist practice, praxis, and I think it applies as much, if not more so, in tech world than it does anywhere else. The act of squashing bugs is something that's necessary. If you ever want anything to run properly, there are people on the back end behind the curtain who are making this happen all the time. And as you'll see in my next couple of slides, the problems that I identified with the way that, uh, that these workers are racialized has only increased in the United States in the last few years. And of course, um, the play around masculinity and technical labor is fractally recursive. It can be applied to nimble fingered, supposedly nimble fingered factory workers assembling keyboards as I, in Iwa Ong's work. It can also become a trope of working class politics, which has a history that goes back all the way to the 19th century. Um, so one of the things that I have turned to since publishing that book is I've been trying to understand in the uh, in Seattle's tech economy writ large, what has happened since 2016? How has the Asian tech worker been figured in debates about um, labor, technology, race, gender since the, uh, the presidential presidential election. And so what I'm, I've published this result, these results uh, recently in this article that I'm showing you here. What I'm going to do now, and I'm going to issue a, just a, a little bit of a warning because I'm gonna read out some things that are frankly fairly unpleasant uh, that I talk about in this article. Um, 
My first example comes from an internal messaging board from a Seattle area tech company. So when I was doing this research, I was interviewing uh, people, I was monitoring tech boards, I was going to community meetings um, and everything in between. Um, there was a post put on a put on a internal message board and the topic read why South Indians don't groom themselves well and I refuse to put this up as a slide. This is why I'm reading it to you. It's fairly long, but some of the things it says are can someone please help me understand why most of the South Indians don't care about their grooming attire and body odor. How much does it take to put on a nice cologne or deodorant. Please spare me the grief. I'm not a racist or a bigot. By the way, I have a couple of very close friends who are South Indians, amazing guys. So I think it can't be as hard for others. Okay, so here you have all the tropes of uh, someone who claims they're not a bigot, but clearly is, who is using um, tropes of embodiment of smell and odor to again make claims about the imperfect or um, or uh, dirty masculinity of non-white men. And before I get any comments about the picture in the top right quarter, I just pulled a screenshot of some South Asian actors um, because I wasn't going to put up a picture of South Indian men um, to to um, to show, in a sense, how ridiculous these kinds of arguments are. Um, the, this this post was actually um, downvoted. The person who posted it was banned from the internal messaging board. So there are a lot of complicated politics here around um, the boundaries of what is acceptable or unacceptable speech in tech companies when it comes to race and gender. Um, but at the same time that these sorts of discourses were popping up in, um, in ch chat rooms, in tech firms, there was also um, an uptick in violent incidents against Asian tech workers. And that has only increased in the current um, COVID pandemic work moment. And of course, now we're not only talking about tech workers, but um, Asians and Asians American, Americans in general. But there was also um, a series of anti-tech worker videos and screeds that were being circulated on the internet. And um, if one of the points through which these racist um, imaginaries are explicated is through uh, tropes of gender, Another gender trope through which it often happens is through the trope of reproduction. So in political economies of AI and its imaginaries of the world, there are some bodies that make and produce applications for machine learning and other bodies that should be the recipients of these technologies efficiencies. So-called third world bodies should receive uh, and be grateful for and be surveilled by machine systems. Uh, and when they're not behaving properly in that way as recipients of technological development, they become a problem. So in another uh, video that was circulating, uh, again, a little bit of a warning here about what I'm about to read, it's pretty awful. Um, the narration says the following. I was on the ground, iPhone camera in hand, recording images and videos that tell a story that a photo can tell in which thousands of words could not explain. I was stunned over the numbers of Indians that overwhelmed this park. The adjacent Little League Park was empty. What was once a park for the community has been taken over by the guest workers now turned visa holders in possession of many, and then it's a bunch of dollar signs. I know of the IT layoffs in the area over the years and have observed the Indians moving into the neighborhood slowly over the years, but this year was different. And then uh, the screed was which about 20 pages long, went on to talk about cricket replacing baseball. And then it also talked about uh, these people turning the park into a hell hole, bringing down the neighborhood, bringing down the neighborhood. And it referred to H4 mommies who will take your jobs 
com uh, and that talked about the onslaught and the transfer of wealth. It referred to the traditional Indian garment and starving Indians back home. And also mentioned the lovely matrons gathering to chit chat and push their strollers all the while talking about the money they had made and how to spend it. So um, what I'm trying to point out here is that gender is often a point of articulation with other things. And of course, Catherine and Lauren have talked about intersecting forms of oppression. And here we can see the way that gender um, tropes of unwanted dirty masculinity and um, unnecessary or population related reproduction are used to to sediment a certain kind of racialization of labor that is both disavowed by the tech industry, but also helps the tech industry run because in fact, that very division of labor is used to solidify where people land in, in a stack. Um, one of the thing that, things that Mona asked us to talk about a little bit are, uh, are kind of hopeful signs or thing, things that we think are, are, are interesting and working well. And um, there's, there's many to choose from. And to be quite honest, I think Catherine and, and Laura's book does an amazing job of pulling these out. But two in relationship to what I've been talking about that I particularly wanted to mention. The first is a form, right? Um, that's online, you can find it put out by the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Group that is actually collecting anti-Asian hate incidences um, or hate incidences in general, to be honest, um, around COVID, around the COVID-19 virus. And I put up this particular slide from their website because you can see how deeply they're thinking about this issue. So they're thinking about race, they're thinking about ethnicity, sexuality, non-conforming status, anti-Semitism, anti-disability and so on. And so I think efforts like this are actually doing the work of asking different questions of the systems that are in place. They are querying the systems, they are producing counter narratives, and they're actually at this moment showing us an infrastructure that has not done an adequate job of asking these questions in the past. The second um, example that I put up, and I have three, is a group called Caremongers. It's, it's um, transnational, but I put up in particular the, the one from India because in fact, what it is, is that it's a kind of citizen um, data collection and help organization, a little bit like Invisible Hands, for those of you who have thought of that, who have heard of that. Um, and it seems to be working incredibly well to care people during the pandemic. And then my final example is actually um, a publication from the Tricontinental Institute, which pulls images together in order to calculate the rate of exploitation, which is basically the difference between the amount of labor a Foxconn worker and people mining rare minerals put into the iPhone versus the amount that that iPhone is sold for. So for me, these are kind of three really good examples that try to get at some of these larger questions of political economy when it comes to thinking through gender and computational structures. Um, finally, I wanted to mention one thing that I have been thinking through, and um, I have a piece on it for those who might be interested. I'm really interested to think about how people get to their political orientations. I mean, this is a almost a question I would love to uh, bring to the group as a whole, because I think all of us have probably gotten to our uh, schema for thinking about computation, gender, and justice um, from very particular stories. And I've been trying to think with feminist philosopher Kathleen Stewart's idea of attunement um, to try to bring us um, to, to bring us to think a little bit more concretely about how we move from um, a critique to a sense of where possibilities could be um, could be emerging. Um, I have some other things that we can talk about about surveillance, but I think I will end it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarita, and thank you, uh, Mark, Catherine, and Lauren for these really amazing remarks. I have a big sheet of notes for, for the conversation, but please 
allow me to uh, hand back over to Lisa um, for some thoughts on uh, the themes that have been presented. Well, I said this during my introduction that this was going to be a rock star panel, and of course uh, it was. I mean, um, I had to turn off my camera because I was writing so furiously and trying to take notes to prepare for these comments. Um, so thank you again to all of the panelists. I think we've all learned a lot, um, but I want to start by just uh, reflecting on some of these comments. Mara, thank you for the history and asking us to consider right, imposed identities and how categorizations work in terms of how women are rendered visible and invisible. Uh, the examples provided from the 1960s and the, the ways in which you talked about um, uh, trans communities and how we have to be vigilant as we apply uh, technologies. And of course, uh, asking us to and reminding us that we are in control of the technologies and our decisions often matter about who counts and who doesn't. Um, you've also reminded us that these are not new concerns or issues and that these systems are designed and redesigned um, and related to specific contexts, histories, and people. So again, thank you for the history. As, as AI reimagines our descriptions, we have to be more accurate and I really appreciated the ways in which you talked about, right, the accuracy of describing what AI is or could be. And thank you for also pro uh, pointing out the glaring disparities in this pandemic and how uh, we might use data in the public interest to raise more questions about disruptions um, in terms of the notions and static notions of race, gender, et cetera. Um, to Catherine and Lauren, thank you so much for your comments as well. Um, bias, unfortunately, remains <laughs> ever present and sometimes seemingly omnipresent. Um, and so I really appreciated you reminding us of through the Amazon examples of what that looked like. An intersectional approach, and of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Kimberly, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's work is amazing and the applications in terms of the way you think about that uh, in terms of technological data and processes. And I think it could lead to sort of new possibilities. And I like that idea of new, new possibilities. Um, and of course, we have to remain cognizant of how we use and apply definitions of what is an asset and what is a problem, right? And I have this joke, I wake up every morning, every day, and I look in the mirror and I say, am I the problem? No, I don't. I say, I don't see a problem, right? And so I think sometimes when we're defining diverse communities, we say they're the problem. And I really appreciate you talking about the systems and how we need to th reflect on those systems as we think about corrections. And then Sarita, thank you for uh, your comments as well, uh, asking us to think about labor, right? And whose work matters, how work is valued and devalued, uh, how that is very gendered and racialized in particular economies and contexts. Um, I think this is very, uh, relates very much to today in terms of thinking about how we categorize essential workers and non-essential workers. And right, and I've been thinking a lot about the people who clean the hospitals, right? And that that labor is often discounted in these moments when we are um, thinking about who matters, right? And if we don't have clean hospitals, clean grocery stores, et cetera, we are uh, right, gonna be in serious trouble. So this issue of labor and otherness and then who occupies the space of particular kinds of labor is, is ab absolutely crucial. And of course, incredibly gendered. I also appreciated you leaving us with, um, of course, um, some reflections about hope and, and bringing us back to the work of, of, of Catherine and Lauren and, and also some concrete examples, right? Because sometimes it's, it's really important, I think, to have those concrete examples. And unfortunately, um, you also gave us some concrete examples of the way that racism and xenophobia and bias remain pernicious and violence, right? And so I think we also need to remain cogniz very cognizant of that during this time, because as so many of the panelists um, commented, we know that during this pandemic, we're seeing some of that. But let's, uh, let's go back to the hope. So I just want to say again, um, thank you to this panel. I said it was a rock star, superstar panel. And, um, and Indeed, it has been. And I think what you've all demonstrated to us is that there's much more work that we can do and that there are many more possibilities to think about how we reframe, reimagine um, AI and data collection, data analytics, et cetera. So thank you for just letting me be a part of this and listen and be a co-sponsor with Mona. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I can just, uh, I can just second that. I'm very grateful to be in this room 
with you and with everybody. Um, I have a sort of, I, oh, I also have a ton of notes and um, what really uh, resonated with me and sort of came through were of course the issues of classification, but um, also of extraction. Uh, so classification as extraction and, and also in the context of sort of um, who gets classified as essential worker now in the pandemic um, and, and who is valued in what way and sort of it got me really thinking about as Mar presented the tech worker movement uh, and sort of all the wonderful um, movements that we're also seeing and uh, not just in activism but also in the academy. Um, and I want to ask one question that um, keeps me up at night a little bit uh, as, as a scholar, but also as an educator, which is around intersectionality. So we, um, we hear, we, we've, uh, we've heard this term many times, and we hear this term many times, and we've, we're seeing this term um, now uh, in, in the mainstream discourse, which is really interesting and, and important in so many ways. Uh, I also see it on tote bags in Brooklyn. Um, and I, so I do, I do um, wonder, um, knowing um, how, and hearing from you how uh, categorization and classification uh, as oppressive systems sort of are the fuel or the infrastructure for harmful artificial intelligence um, and how the, we can understand that through intersectionality. And then also seeing intersectionality as really um, anchored in identity and lived experience. And um, I sort of wonder really practically almost as it were, how we can bring that together. How can we center lived experience um, in, in data science? And isn't that sort of in some ways fundamentally at odds with the way in which these computational systems actually work? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna that's actually a question for everybody. Um, and I would, I would love to start uh, with Mar. Yeah, that's a great question. I'll try, I'll try not to whiff on it. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, the amazing comments made by Lauren, Sarita, Catherine, um, really kind of foreground the crux of this, this issue, how how much flattening can an individual undergo before that becomes dehumanizing? And you know that can be done in better or worse ways. It can be done in ways that are explicitly racist and terrible, as you know Sarita showed. You know in these examples where um, you know she's showing people who are making you know these technologies who are. Um, stereotyping and um, just, you know, using incredibly racist tropes to refer to people who are in some cases even just their co-workers. Um, so it can be, you know, monstrous, like clearly, or it can be done in ways that, uh, you know, kind of attempt to um, keep yeah, people's right. humanity in the foreground in a way that, you know, the data can be used in the public interest. But there's always this level of, um, flattening that has to go on gotcha. when you take a person and you make them into even an overlapping set of categories. Um, so I don't, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, but I guess just historically, what I would say is that one of the ways that pushback seems to happen it, it effectively is just by being very open and honest and making sure that is always part of the conversation, that there is this flattening going on, that there is this risk of dehumanization and that it's not seen as um, a net positive, that it's not seen as, oh, this is just more efficient. This is more true in some way. This is going to be helpful, um, that those always have to be just kind of you know, on one side of the scale and then on the other side of the scale, there always has to be this conversation about what's getting left out. And I feel like all of the people on this panel have shown, you know, so well how to do that. And then there are also, you know, a lot of other scholars, some of whom I mentioned in, in my talk and who are mentioned in other talks who are doing that work. And so I guess that's where I would place my hope and, and sort of that's how I would answer, you know, that question. Thank you, Mar. And that sort of really 
um, highlights again for me at least also the question of who does who does that work of you know leveling the scale a little bit right like who who is tasked with doing that and what kinds of resources do we actually make available for that work and so Sarita I wonder um, what your thoughts are on on complicating intersectionality in, in that way especially against the backdrop of the work that you presented to us today yeah, thank you. I really appreciate Mar's response. I mean, the, the way I would kind of pick up the thread of this is to think through um, what, what questions are being asked of the data. So I think what we're all noticing is that the systems that we have in place are asking a very narrow set of questions for a very narrow set of people. And so there, there is, I think, there will always be, there will never be a perfect, pure set of data, as Mar says, that doesn't flatten. We have to keep that process open to critique from below so that the new questions can be asked and um, new kinds of data can be collected. But also, you know, as Audra Simpson says, and Ruha Benjamin as well, that, that there is the ability to refuse uh, modes of classification. We can think about informed refusal in the way that Ruha talks about it. In terms of thinking about intersectionality as a concept, and I'm going to pick up on your toe bag point, Mona, because I think that is a really important thing to think about. We do um, exist in a world in which ideas are commodities and they can be commoditized, which, which isn't necessarily always a bad thing. As you said, it means that those ideas have spread and reach, but it also means that those ideas become part of a system of, uh, of exchange value. And so therefore, to me, one of the things that I always want to think about with a term like intersectionality is, as, uh, as Catherine and Lauren says, uh, you know, really go back and do our reading and see what's actually in Dr. Crenshaw's text. The one line that struck me the last time I read it was the fact that we're not only talking about interlocking systems of oppression, we're not only talking about individuals and, and structures, but we're also talking about the way in which in certain contexts or environments, particular groups um, can actually sort of edge out others, right? So if you think about the Asian tech worker in particular, they, they really occupy this very ambiguous middle category. And then if you would add caste to that analysis, you would have a whole other set of cascading inequalities that you have to contend with. So there again, the, the field isn't bounded. But in answer to your question, there's one thing I wanted to bring out, which unfortunately um, I didn't actually name on, on one of my slides, but on the slide called, called reproduction, I also listed at the bottom lots of other thinkers who bring a different kind of valence to the discussion of intersectionality. And they are, I'll just name them, Alexander Wehelie, Nayan Shah, Aiko Day, Nida Anastasowski, and Kalindi Vora. Uh, there's also Catherine, Catherine um, McKittrick's work and so many others. So I think for me, um, and this, this is why I, I was trying to bring Stuart Hall into the discussion as well, um, we, we want to always broaden out uh, our resource and our resources for analysis rather than um, thinking of one as the, the perfect uh, commodity, commodified solution to our, our critical, um, our, our critical critical apparatus. Thank you so much, Sarita. Um, and that's actually a great segue to, to hand over to, to Lauren and Catherine um, with sort of the same question, but also asking how do you see your framework and your work in the context of data feminism sit with that or around that? Um, yeah, I'll go first and then pass to Lauren. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a super interesting question what you asked in regards to the, um, like, how do we, you know, feminism is a body of work that values lived experience precisely because lived experience has been of women and other minoritized people has been kind of written out of the canon and doesn't exist in so many ways in archives. Um, and, and so how do we value that at the same time as we are collecting data and, uh, you know, aspiring. I've often been thinking recently about like that. Yes, I think there's these inherent tensions in a field like computer science where to demonstrate relevance, 
what you want to do is you want to make a generalized solution. Abstraction is like a really fundamental principle of, of computer science. You want to generalize abstract things out, put them in little black boxes um, so that you can just plug in new things. Um, that's like sort of very antithetical to feminist principles of context, embodiedness, situated knowledge, and so on. Um, but I mean, one of the things we try to point out repeatedly through example in the book is that those things currently as they are practiced, yes, they are intention, except there are also all these other folks who are showing us the way through that. And so the folks that we would point to from the book are people like the anti-eviction mapping project, for example. So like they're a really interesting case where they, they started by putting dots on maps about where evictions were happening in San Francisco. Um, and quickly sort of had the same critiques of their own work where they were like, this is very reductive, <laughs> you know, like we are, we are flattening people's lived experiences into a dot and like, what are these, what does it actually feel like to be evicted? How do we tell those stories in a kind of a deeper and sort of multimodal way? Um, and that's where they began an oral history project. Um, and they work in deeply sort of embedded um, community ways. They work in coalition with tenants rights organizations. Um, and so, I think, you know, one of the things that we talk about is how, to me, a lot of these questions are actually around process. They're not actually about whether we value quantitative data or machine learning as a technique in itself. Like it's a, it's a kind of a tool and it's grown up in a super oppressive, terrible circumstances, um, but with a different set of processes and a different set of values guiding those things they could be used for really different purposes. And we see that in their work, or we talk about the work of the EJ Atlas, which is this global environmental justice atlas. Um, and key to some of these kind of process considerations is ideas around actually building real authentic relationships, working kind of within the community that you are a, a also collecting data about, like being of that community, right? Um, building partnerships and, and coalitions um, and uh, yeah, like working as much as possible to like hold those two things uh, hand in hand. Cause I think the one thing my concern would be um, in regards to not us not positing like a sort of false qualitative versus quantitative discussion, right? Like where we're only valuing qualitative. I, I think that can also, um, Again, when we like exclude tools from our toolbox, that can limit our thinking to really look at, well, what macro and structural patterns might we reveal from data-driven systems? Like, I think there's actually a ton of things that can be revealed through those methods as well. And those are important to, that's work is important to do. Um, so Lauren, I don't know if you have anything else there also. Thank you. All of these responses, they've been so generative and I've been taking notes and I'm gonna try to get from point A to point B, but we'll see how, we'll see how we get. Um, you know, one of the thing, one of the, the sort of recent uh, books that comes to mind sort of that is directly invested in this question of intersectionality and its own co-optation is Jennifer Nash's work. Um, she has a book that came out in 2019 called Black Feminism Reimagined Beyond Inter Intersectionality. And she talks a lot about how intersectionality has been essentially co-opted by women and gender studies programs to say like, look, we're doing an okay job. Um, we're being intersectional, but then to, I think it was Savita's point earlier, you know, who is doing the work of making these departments intersectional? It's the black women who then bear all sorts of consequences for this work. And some of this has to do with the academic things like tenure and promotion and things like this, but other parts of that is physical. Like there are physical effects on people's bodies for doing this work. Um, and I think that that is such a important and cautionary tale. Um, and I think if I could sort of make the leap here, this is where my notes sort of break down, but thinking about sort of that example with respect to data and sort of the types of things that are captured easily in data, like look at our metrics, we're diverse now, versus what is the human cost on people and their lives and their bodies for doing this work, which is not captured in sort of data to sort of bring it back to Mars point, sort of as data is without much intentionality is just sort of thought to be collected, right? And then this sort of brings up the point, well, you know, if you are informed by this full range of human experience it, and you are someone who has the ability 
either to yourself, create the categories or collect the data or ally yourself with a community or be from a community to say, actually, no, we want to capture data on this other thing so that so we can sort of redeploy or the, the sort of the power of data to say like, look, this is also a thing that is real. Look at these people, you know, like actually dying because of this work or experiencing incredibly harmful effects. That is one way that I think, again, data, you know, collected intentionally um, and sort of coming from within a community can potentially be used to shed light, sort of greater light on some of the effects that are happening. And, you know, with all of the caveats that I think we would all 100% sign up for immediately, which is like data will never tell you anything. It will never capture everything. The exact same act of data collection for some people can be used by, you know, that exact same data set can be used by other people for tremendous harm. You know, you always need to be, you know, I think about both about being you know, vigilant, but also just the tremendous amount of responsibility that comes from being a person who collects data and who needs to care for that data. And, and I'm sure, you know, like what's, once it's on your hard drive or in your cloud account, you know, where does it go after that? Who's gonna take care of it? Um, you know, I think these are all lessons that stem from, I think the really important discussions that have been started from black feminist theories of intersectionality, but sort of spill over into this much broader environment in which data is everywhere. And I think, again, you know, subject to all of these same forces. Um, maybe I'll, uh, yeah, I'll stop there for now. Thank you so much for these, well, these thoughts and my mind is going, 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 going. And, and so is the clock. So um, at, at this, <laughs> so at this point, just a reminder to our viewers, uh, please, you can um, ask questions to our wonderful panel uh, through um, the YouTube, um, uh, comment box or um, on Twitter um, at the uh, tweet at the IPK account. Um, I want to actually take a step back as as uh, as co-host and um, ask everybody in this Zoom room if you had any questions for each other or a sort of comments or things that you really um, sort of wanted to pick up on from the uh, conversation that has really I feel just opened up and we could talk for hours. I'd like to pick up on something Catherine was saying about the quant qual divide. So I've been thinking about this quite a bit and it seems to me there, there's a kind of common problematic that goes across them, which I find a lot in, in ethnography. Um, there is a kind of knee-jerk response that, tell, that says data is true because it was collected through purportedly neutral processes and it's scientific. But there's this equal and opposite response that suggests that um, interviews are true because they also seem to be collected without um, interference and respect the and represent the actual words of the people. And so it seems to me that what both of those, it's not a quant qual problem, I can agree with you completely, but both of those positions are lacking is, um, is the understanding that everything is subjected to a frame of interpretation. And so that's where, to me, thinking through um, the historical cases in the way that Mar does is so important because it gives you a, an immediate sense that the data that's being produced through, through, uh, through qualitative or quantitative tools is being produced in a particular time and place with a particular set of concerns and a particular set of actors in mind. And that actually is, is what we need to understand to a great, to a great extent. If I can just um, jump on that, um, thank you. That I really, really appreciate those comments. And I was, I was also thinking about sort of this similar issue of the way I think in a lot of situations we are encouraged to use the term quantitative when in fact it is just a different type of qualitative. You know that adding numbers to qualitative data does not essentially make it quantitative, nor does it make it somehow more true. So I really appreciated how you drew that out. Um, but what I actually wanted to um, say was that, Sarita, you talked about groups, uh, I think you put it as queering systems and producing counter narratives. And I thought, I thought that that was very hopeful and very important. And if there's space for that, like I would love to hear more from you or everybody about that. Um, 
I, I guess just to offer one like very small, um, you know, example from, from my work um, that might start to fit into that is the way in which I, I do, and I think more and more historians now understand the importance when talking about, for instance, trans subjects to use contemporary methods or contemporary um, norms of, you know, being respectful and not dead naming people and just like very basic things like that, which until recently in the historical profession, that just, that wasn't done. And I think that there were, um, you know, there was sort of either a generation or a group of historians who kind of tried to queer those systems of narrative and historiography and sort of push back um, against that. So from, from my field, maybe that's one like just very small example, but I would love to hear other kind of like hopeful or progressive examples from other folks. Lauren and Catherine, do you wanna jump on that? I mean, yeah, I think that's a lot of what we tried to show in our book were examples like this that could try to give us precisely hope. <laughs> um, and but I do think it's like the the queering the system or like based on my background, I would call it hacking the system. But like I think the um, that mentality, it is why we would sort of characterize what we're doing as a kind of count in a way a counter data science, right? Because the mainstream data science is clearly not. Uh, serving as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think to be concrete about it, um, I, I think of folks who are doing um, kind of like the project that Sarita showed um, that's collecting incidents of um, hate crimes or discrimination that people are encountering right now. Um, this is an example for me of collecting counter data. Um, so folks who are coming from below and saying, well, nobody's caring about this, like counting institutions are systematically failing us. How do we step into that gap and count the data ourselves and use that as part of a kind of creation of a counter public and potentially kind of uh, potentially allied with social movements, potentially not, um, but a way to, in a sense, hold institutions accountable or a way to advance a counter narrative. Um, I mean, I, that's what I see, for example, the an eviction mapping project doing is creating a counter narrative um, to the kind of economic development narrative of San Francisco, for example. Um, and so I think we can learn a lot by um, pursuing those projects that are doing that counter data work. And I, there's a lot of those projects that a lot of those projects are being done in the arts and journalism. Uh, data for Black Lives has launched an effort to collect race and ethnicity data. Uh, which is not being systematically counted at any level right now in the United States. Um, so like, I think that those examples give me hope because they're examples of people who are coming together and using data as an organizing advocacy and relationship building tool precisely to challenge systems of power that are failing them. Lauren, would you like to add? Or? Oh, sure. I mean, I think, you know, there, as Catherine said, you know, there's a there's a lot of work that is taking place in terms of, you know, collecting counter data, sort of speaking back to power, um, you know, refusing data um, and sort of making all of these stances, I think, much more visible. Um, and I think that that is important and necessary and, you know, absolutely should continue. I mean, if I had to add anything to what's been said already, it's the people who are also trying to sort of remake, sort of remake the tools and the techniques that have traditionally been wielded by people in positions in power in order to do other things. So I think, you know, in the art world, people like Stephanie Dinkins, who has this really amazing sort of sculpture with some AI stuff inside that was trained on her family, several generations of her family's experience. She is black, she is has a really interesting family history and it's a museum piece. Like you go in and you interact with it and you talk with it. And this is, um, you know, I think she's just sort of trying to do something different with this technology that, you know, for the most part is used to control and surveil and police and things like this. Um, I'm thinking a little bit about, uh, 
the people who are sort of aware of abstraction as a power, sort of as, as a means of wielding power, but sort of for good and for ill, right? Um, you know, we've talked about this a little bit in the book, Fernanda Viegas, who's a visualization designer, um, says that she really likes thinking about sort of the large, like the big picture view as a superpower because you can change people's minds in a single, you know, you know, every, you know, there's a large critique that has to, that is totally out there about the belief that you can see a single image and understand everything, right? Like that's not the takeaway. But if you are someone who has the ability to sort of create some sort of distillation of a problem at hand, or even a, you know, a good thing to say like, look here, this exists. You know, I think of um, like the Atlas of Caregiving as a project that I really like a lot. Um, that is trying to think of ways to measure and sort of provide both quantitative and visual testament to the work, to care work. Um, and so I just think that, you know, again, I think it always comes from, you know, it's always rooted in context um, and sort of in the setting in which these projects come about, the people who are undertaking them, the people who are they're sort of working with in order to produce these projects. But yeah, I mean, there's a really, I mean, I think there's just a whole wide world out there of such a, you know, a inspiring range of stuff um, that, yeah, that's sort of what I would say. Thank you so much. And um, I think um, that sort of is a, is a good cue for me to sort of link this back to this very particular moment that we find ourselves in right now. Uh, our own Dati Roy has just recently stated very pointedly that the pandemic is a portal between one world and the next, and of quote, and Alondra Nelson has said uh, recently, quote, the social conditions exposed, exacerbated, and created by the novel coronavirus demand that we substantively rethink our ideas of society, end of quote. And I do think that this conversation has really helped us do that. And so it's again, my pleasure to hand back to Lisa uh, to say a few words uh, to close the panel. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna just say a few brief words. Thank you for uh, mentioning Alondra. She was, we were in school together. And so um, <laughs> so uh, that's a special treat. Um, and obviously we talk pretty often, but I just wanna say again, tremendous, just tremendous. And the contributions, the conversation, even these last and, and talking back and forth, just fantastic. And so I, um, I think, I hope, I hope that, and I imagine people in the audience have learned a lot. And also the fact that everyone has come back to this idea of possibility and hope, right? And I think uh, right now we need that and we need to be thinking about what the possibilities are as we go through this portal, right? To what, to what is next. So um, let me end by saying, I hope everyone continues to take very good care of themselves, their colleagues. Um, I've been saying, you know, I was glad to see, um, uh, Lauren, your daughter in the background, right? Um, our new colleagues are our pets, our children, our uh, et cetera. And never has that been more present for women who have gone home to take care of a lot of things. And we're seeing the implications of that. So um, just take good care, be well. And I'm looking forward to you know more, more conversations and more possibility. Thank you so much, Lisa. And with that, we're actually uh, ending. Thank you, Sarita. Lisa, Lauren, Mar, and Catherine for this really wonderful conversation that leaves my heart full. I want to thank uh, Team IPK, Eric Kleinenberg and Jessica Coffey uh, who are helming IPK, but also Zari, Ari, and Sam who always help to make the Co-Opting AI event such a success. Um, Ellen Toscano, of course, and her team at 370J um, for her fantastic support of, of everything we do. The TCS department specifically uh, Dania Glabau and Jonathan Soffer, um, and of course, Lisa, you and your team, thank you for co-hosting the event tonight. Um, I really appreciate the conversation uh, we've been having. Uh, everybody, please continue to be well and safe and your loved ones. And I do look forward to welcoming everybody back in the fall uh, with new Coping AI events. And the first one will be on journalism. It was my pleasure. Thank you for another great season and um, have a good one. <laughs>